Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Greetings and welcome to Commission Ed, the podcast where we discuss Air Force officership. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. This week, we'll be discussing what is an officer. But given that this is our first episode, we want to take the opportunity to introduce ourselves so that you know exactly who we are, where we're coming from. I am Captain Colin Slade. I am an Air Force officer. I am a reservist working in Air Force ROTC on a temporary active duty tour. So I am an instructor at Detachment 855, Brigham Young University, where I am currently the operations flight commander, which places me directly in charge of 186 cadets and their training as they prepare themselves to become officers in the Air Force. I am a product of Air Force ROTC as well through Brigham Young University. I graduated in 2011 with a degree in mechanical engineering after which the Air Force had me become a civil engineer. I spent four years in civil engineering, which included two deployments overseas. After that, I decided to leave active duty and join the reserves. I got a job working as an academic advisor at Utah Valley University, where I learned a lot of the inner workings of the university and how it interfaces with special programs like Air Force ROTC. But while I was in that position, I missed my brothers and sisters in arms and started looking for a way to come back and wear the uniform again. It was during that time that I found out about this opportunity to become an Air Force ROTC instructor on a temporary basis. Since my time leaving uh, active duty, I have also been working on a PhD through the University of Limerick in Ireland. The topic of my dissertation is military drill in the United States and the effects of synchronized performance on an audience. And so if you hear me talk about drill a lot and emphasize how important it is, it is because I am completely and unabashedly biased towards drill. That doesn't surprise me one bit. (laughs) Great, great rundown. So my background is also equally diverse and unique. I don't know any other dance major studiers in the Air Force. Just going to throw that out there. (laughs) Uh, And we're grateful for that diversity. I'm sure we'll talk about that another time. Uh, So I have a master's and bachelor's degree in cell biology from Utah State University. I commissioned through officer training school in 2011. A large portion of the reason I joined the Air Force admittedly was the downturn in the economy. I graduated in 2009 and was competing with a lot of people who had been laid off for a year or two, and I was a brand new hire, and so it was hard to compete with them for jobs. It pushed me towards military service, something I'm very grateful for. Originally commissioned as a scientist, I was a chemist, and after one year in that career field, the Air Force decided that they needed to change my career field or I needed to get out. So I took the opportunity to look around, find other opportunities, and I became an intelligence officer. I did that for three years. Uh, During that time, I did one combat deployment to bring the fight against ISIS when they were rolling into Iraq. After that time at my first assignment, I was selected to be an OTS instructor. And so I went back to Maxwell Air Force Base where I commissioned and taught cadets there for two years. And after that, I've returned back into intelligence. I'm currently active duty, also a captain, and looking forward to this opportunity to share some of my background and experience with all of you. Awesome. Reed, how do we know each other? We met at one of the first professional military education opportunities that were available at the time when we commissioned. Uh, It's since been decommissioned. Actually, we were in the last class. We were so bad, they shut it down after us. Perhaps. Our, our national anthem was bad enough to cancel it. <laughs> I'll have to dig up that video and put it in the show notes. Okay. Wow. That's bold. Okay. But we're going we're gonna to go for it here. So uh, it was air and space basic course. The idea was to bring everyone from their disparate commissioning sources, bring them into one central location, give them a shared common experience, which has immense value for building esprit de corps and development of links and ties between people. We hit it off pretty instantly. And still to this day, we've maintained our friendship. It was a good time. It was a good time. 
And that's a perfect segue actually into what the purpose and intent of this podcast is. We are uniquely placed as people who are instructing young men and women who are trying to become lieutenants in the United States Air Force. I have my experience not only as a graduate of an officer training school, but then to go back as an instructor. And then you call an ROTC product and now ROTC instructor. And these developmental and training opportunities, we believe are crucial to a successful career. And we found that there's a lack of information about what this is, what this journey is, what it means to be an officer, a member of the profession of arms. And the development and mentorship that happens at the early stages, and for those who are interested in this life, we want to fill some of those gaps that people out there may have. Yeah, and I think an important thing to note there is between your experience in OTS and mine in ROTC, that covers the vast majority of the commissioning sources for officers going into the Air Force. The third one that's left out, obviously, is the Air Force Academy. But percentage-wise, OTS and ROTC produce the vast majority of the officers that go into the Air Force. And so it's not to discount what happens at the Air Force Academy, but what you hear from us, by and large, going to be the experience of anybody that is wanting to come into the Air Force, especially if they've already started college or have finished it. But in addition to that, we want to also not talk just about the commissioning programs, but the development of officers after they have already commissioned. So some of what we want to discuss is professional military education, evaluations, special duty opportunities, various other things that go hand in hand with the the development of an officer. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. That's a great point, Colin. And that brings up kind of the next thing we need to mention, that this is all in an unofficial capacity. We are doing this as people who, yes, are subject matter experts, but we don't know everything. And if any of you listeners out there would like to participate and contribute to this, we are more than happy to bring in that experience as we can contribute to the mentorship and education of everyone involved. And last thing we have to say it, views expressed here are those solely of the author and do not represent an official position of the United States Air Force or the Department of Defense. You're going to hear that over and over and over again, because we want to be open and honest with you all. We are not trying to hide our identities in any sort of way. We are telling you exactly who we are. We are telling you exactly what our experience has been. But at the same time, we want to stay within the left and right bounds that the Air Force and the U.S. government has placed upon us, meaning we are not the official word of of the Air Force or the government. While you can take us at our word, but that doesn't mean that you should be going out publicizing on the social medias, any news sources or anything like that saying, hey, the Air Force said this or the government thinks this. That's just not true. We will do our best to uh, provide you the highest quality content, the most factual information that that is available. But if you want the official Air Force source truth, reach out to your commander, contact public affairs, your local base agencies. That's where you're going to get the official word. And on that note, like what Reed said earlier, we don't know everything. We don't know anything really about what it's like to be at the Air Force Academy. We certainly don't know anything about what it's like to commission into the other services. Our area of expertise is the Air Force, what it means to be an officer for the Air Force, how we produce officers within the Air Force. And we highly encourage you to engage with us on those topics and reach out to sister services and those experts in order to get that official information as well. So we're going to try to bring in guests as often as we can, especially when they have expertise in a certain area. But we're going to talk about things that we are passionate about. Our intent is to bring you these these episodes as often as operational schedules for the Air Force allow. We would like it to be weekly, but who knows? Operational requirements change. So stay flexible with us. Stay tuned. We will get you the highest quality content as often as we possibly can. So as I said, we are discussing in today's episode, what is an officer? This is the Air Force Officer Podcast. So we felt it was important that we start at the very beginning. What is an officer to begin with? The way that we're going to approach this is we're going to first take a look at the legal documents that govern what an officer is. And from there, Reed and I will share our own personal thoughts based on our own experience, our own education, our own development what we think an officer is or what an officer should be. 
So I'm going to start off with, which I think is a really fascinating thing. When we swear an oath and you join the military, you join the profession of arms, you swear to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And that is where we find the basis for what it is to be an officer in Title 10 of the U.S. Code. I'm not going to read all of those sections, but it's subtitle A, Part 2, Chapter 33, Section 532. So if you really want to, you can, you can look this all up. I think there's some really fascinating things in here that I just kind of want to highlight. So first, you have to be a citizen of the United States. I think that makes sense. But believe it or not, that actually can be a challenge for those who are born somewhere else and come over here and want to join. The second one is something that I'll, I'll come back to a couple times today, uh, is of good moral character. We'll go into that much more in depth when we get into kind of our thoughts on this. You have to be physically qualified for active service. And then the fourth is something, again, I'll come back to. Other special qualifications, essentially, we get to pick the rules of the club, right? Our, each service basically gets to determine what those things are. So do you want to talk about what the Air Force says it's looking for? Absolutely. So this comes from Air Force Instruction 36-2005, titled Officer Sessions. It's a unwieldy document. It has lots of verbiage in there, a lot of things that outline various special cases for what an officer is. But if you really boil it down to the essential eligibility requirements, there are eight things that are common across all Air Force officers. As already mentioned, the first one is that you must be an American citizen. Interesting thing about that one, though, I mm -hmm. found an exception to it. Interesting. I was not aware that there was an exception. The Secretary of the Air Force can make an exception, but it has to be an extreme circumstance in order to make that exception. It would be interesting to dig in somewhere and see where, when, if that exception has ever been made. I suspect strongly that there's a reason that there's an exception in there. Something must have come up. Right. Yeah, yeah be, that would be a really interesting case study. So second to being an American citizen, Anybody who wants to be an officer in the Air Force must not be a conscientious objector. Reed, can you tell us what a conscientious objector is? A conscientious objector is someone who has a deeply held personal moral belief against the use of force. There are some faith traditions and other cultures that are against using force against their fellow men. And those people constitute what is a conscientious objector. Right. Yeah. A familiar example that has come up recently is from the movie Hacksaw Ridge. The entire movie is based around this one particular individual who is a conscientious objector. Now, he was able to, to serve in the military, but he was a private. He was not an officer. And that's an important distinction to make there is that you cannot be an officer in the Air Force and be also a conscientious objector. Can I add something in there real quick? Please. I think it's important to note that this does not mean that you thrive off the blood of your enemies. It doesn't mean that you have to be a bloodthirsty individual. It just means you cannot have a deeply held moral conviction against use of force. It is my most deep and sincere desire that I do not have to use force on behalf of the nation to make my enemies succumb to our will. History has shown that that force is required, and I'm happy to fulfill that role for my nation. Sometimes we'd have counseling sessions with cadets, and they'd say things like, well, I don't really want to kill people, but I will if I'm asked to. And, and that's the kind of things we had to talk through sometimes. So that's the second one is you can't be a conscientious objector. Also in line with the, the Title X requirements, the Air Force requires that you be of sound moral character. Now, this primarily includes a lack of serious criminal activity or use of illicit drugs, but it also includes your ability to obtain a security clearance that is relative to your specific responsibility as an officer in the Air Force. After the moral character, we get into age limits. You have to be at least 18 to receive a commission. And there are new age requirements that are currently being updated for how old you can possibly be. Usually the maximum age is somewhere around 40, but I've seen as high as 49. It does depend on the career field you're selected for, what component, whether you're active guard or reserve. It also matters if you have some prior enlisted time. So that's actually a pretty complicated question. And if you are in that boat and wondering if you're on that edge, Definitely recommend we get you in front of an expert to work through all those intricacies. Yeah, contact a local recruiter. 
go to a local detachment for Air Force ROTC or get in touch with an OTS instructor or a recruiter. They're definitely the ones that can help you find out if you are within the, the correct age limit for the career that you want to go into or just to get into the Air Force at all. So this is number five now. After age is you must be physically qualified. Now that comes in two pieces. The first and really the biggest one here is that you are medically qualified for service in the Air Force. Now that goes through DODMERB. DODMERB stands for Department of Defense Medical Evaluation Review Board. The second piece of being physically qualified is your level of physical fitness and capability. Now that's primarily going to be measured by your physical fitness test or what we call the fitness assessment or FA. I'm sure that we'll have another episode about our thoughts and feelings on the fitness assessment, but that's for another time. After being physically qualified, so number six is you must have earned a bachelor's degree in order to be an officer in the Air Force. You need to have achieved from an accredited university a degree that warrants Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts. There are some careers in the Air Force that do require a specific bachelor's degree. There are others that do not. They simply require that you have one. So depending on what you're interested in doing, you'll have to select your major accordingly. So number seven is every officer must have passed the Air Force Officer Qualifying Test or AFOQT. The AFOQT is an aptitude test that measures different qualitative, quantitative skills about Air Force-centric things and measures your aptitude to be successful as an officer in the Air Force. Now, Reed, why would we care about your qualitative and quantitative abilities? By the nature of our service, we do a lot of technical stuff. A lot of career fields are very heavily involved in technology very heavily involved in critical thinking, quantitative analysis. As mentioned at the top, I joined as a chemist. My first job was as a nuclear physicist. That requires a little bit of knowledge. And so being able to assess an individual for their capability in that arena is essential. Yes, we need people of all sorts with all different skills and abilities, but our branch is uniquely positioned as one that is much more centered on technology, much more focused on that. You can argue that the entire birth of our service was because of the dramatic advancement and the creation of the aircraft. So that's just, it's kind of built into our DNA and history of who we are. Do we use the ASVAB? I had to take it when I went through MEPS because they wouldn't allow me to go through MEPS without it. Really? Yes. Interesting. I'm going to brag a little bit. I absolutely crushed the ASVAB. <laughs> um, they were like, you can enlist and do any career field you want. But that's when they're like, oh, you're going to OTS. We actually didn't need to do that. And I said, yeah, that's what this like waiver piece of paper said, but they forgot <laughs> to read it. So anyway, I do know it's a progressive test. So it actually gets harder the longer you answer correct questions. And if you continue to answer correct questions, the higher your score goes. And it will kind of reach a point where, okay, you're getting all these questions correct. And then you move on. Yeah, I've never taken it and honestly know nothing about it. It's a much broader test. I mean, I remember answering questions about pretty much everything. I mean, it was a really broad test. As I understand, the test is designed to identify what career fields you would be eligible for and have a higher chance of success in. Again, not something I know enough about, but I did take it. I did do well. And <laughs> that's what I remember. It was a waste of an hour. I'll never get back. Yeah. The ASVAB and the AFOQT are not the same, not even close. The AFOQT is best described as an ACT with an Air Force spin on it. I think that's a really good description. That's absolutely what it felt like. So that is probably the best way to get an idea of what the AFOQT is like. And that's also probably the best way to study for it is to grab yourself an ACT prep book, you know, work your way through that. So that brings us to item number eight, which is you have to meet the requirements as dictated by the Air Force Academy, Air Force ROTC, or OTS. So whatever those commissioning sources require of you at the time, that is what you must do in order to become an officer. Which brings me right back around to some of the things we talked about in Title 10 and that last requirement, other special qualifications, essentially as your military department decides. And then in our Air Force specific requirements, you have to meet whatever requirements we say you do. I think that's a really interesting thing. And that's a unique thing about what we do. We decide who makes it in the club. 
when you think about Title 10, there's actually a really short list. Right. And I think that speaks back to the nature of what we do and the fact that by the nature of our service, we can and will give our lives in the fulfilling of our duties. If they have too many requirements, we're not going to be able to produce enough of us if occasion arises. And so that's where it comes into that interesting part of we decide what's important. We decide who gets into the club. Something I actually really like about this is that it gives me a sense of ownership. This is something that I wanted to be a part of. And now that I'm in, I have some say in what it becomes. It's not too often, I think, that you can join a company with the opportunity to change it into what you want it to be. That's a, a really great thing about being a member of the profession of arms. That is a really interesting point. But Reed, don't you think that sounds really elitist? I can see that perspective, except the requirements are so narrow and they're so narrowly focused on one essential thing, moral character. And I think if you possess moral character, that to me is the antithesis of elitism. Yes, there's some selection involved. Yes, you have to meet certain physical requirements. Yes, you have to be a citizen of this country, but you also have to possess moral character. And a person of high moral character would seek out diverse opinions, would seek out diverse experiences, would seek out people different from themselves because they wouldn't care as much about who you are. They're going to care more about what you do and how well you do it. So I can understand that perspective, but I would counter that moral character, if we do that right, that will get us where we need to be. My contention there is that good moral character is poorly defined. So that, let's explore that. How, that, how would you... All it says in, the, in Title 10 is of good moral character, but elsewhere in Title 10, it does not define good moral character. The Constitution does not define good moral character. So how do we define that requirement and when it's being met? Which is really interesting because that's what I think I focus most of my time as we prepared for this episode and thinking about. What are those traits? What are those qualities? What are those things that I think qualifies someone? Did you have a similar experience, Colin, as you were preparing for this? Did you kind of think about that or, or what aspects were you thinking about? Yeah. So here's what I'm going to say. When you look at the eight things that the Air Force requires, one, American citizen, two, not a conscientious objector, three, sound moral character, four, within the age limit, Five, physically qualified, both medically and level of fitness. Six, have a bachelor's degree. Seven, pass the AFOQT. And eight, meet the specific requirements of the commissioning source. Of those eight things, there's really only three of them that we, the gatekeepers, can control or have any sort of influence on. I can't influence whether or not you're an American citizen. That is just fact, yes or no. I can't influence whether you're a conscientious objector or not. I can't influence your age, obviously. I can't influence whether you're medically qualified. I can't influence your ability to earn a bachelor's degree. I can't make you pass the AFOQT. So really the only things that we have any sort of influence on or any sort of control over is the sound moral character, physical fitness, and then whatever additional requirements to earn that commission. So those have to be the things that you focus on because really those are the only things that we can control or influence. Moral character, physical fitness, and commissioning requirements. Yeah, no, I think that's great that we both narrowed in on those same things. Certainly, and I know we'll get to these in other discussions, uh, that was a lot of the purpose and intent of officer training school was to evaluate and provide opportunities for you to display your moral character. It was certainly the easiest way to disqualify yourself from training, to betray the standards that are expected. Yeah, so tell us what you think about moral character or any of those other things that you feel like are requirements in order to be an officer. What is an officer, Reed? Such a loaded question. Again, I spent many hours thinking about this. Really, you'd think it'd be a lot easier. I relied heavily on a book that I read when I was a brand new lieutenant that's really influenced me. I'll cite a couple of things from that, but I highly recommend it for any of our listeners. It's the Armed Forces Officer by Richard M. Swain and Albert C. Pierce. Maybe we'll put the description of that in the show notes. Absolutely. So again, kind of hearkening back to the things I was talking about, by the nature of our service, the fact that we will live and die potentially for our service, it puts us in a unique group and a member of the profession of arms, something they defined as 
groups of specialists who willingly or unwillingly assume the burden of fighting, killing, and dying for the larger group. Whatever the formal name or title given to these groups, theirs is the profession of arms. So the question is, in my mind, what is it that we're dying and killing and fighting for? What is it? And what is our duty then as an officer? And as I thought about it, for me, it boils down to three things. Someone who learns, someone who serves, and someone who leads. There's a whole lot in there. One who is able to learn displays a necessary humility. By the fact that you are willing to learn, you recognize that you don't know something. And that implies a humility and also constant change in the Department of Defense, in the world geopolitical stage, in conflict. It's always changing. So you have to be someone who's willing to learn. Serve. You have to be someone who is thinking about the benefit of others, thinking about how you can help others, thinking about how you can give of yourself to improve the station of other people. And then lead. You know, another great quote from that book, fighting and leading those who do is the unique role of the armed forces officer. And that for me is the biggest, if, if I had to pick one of those three, it's that idea of lead because everyone, every situation, everything requires a different approach. That doesn't mean that I'm a director. I don't tell people what to do unless that's required. I don't need to compel them unless it's required. Leadership is a gift granted by those who give you their followership. And if you can find a way for your followers to give you their followership, then I want to be that person and I want to follow those people. And so for me, that is what I focus my career on becoming, someone who other people are willing to give their followership to. I have a position of legal authority, but that does not make me a leader. That is something given to me. So for me, that's what it all boils down to. Learn, serve, and lead. Now I'm going to push back on you a little bit. Any enlisted airman, A1C, or even airman basic, up through chief master sergeant can do those exact same things. So what is the difference there? What, why are they not officers? Because it is not their responsibility to be accountable for the results of everything that occurs. That doesn't mean that they're not responsible for what they do, but ultimately, by legal definition, the officer is responsible for the outcome. So really, it's not about moral character. It's about responsibility then. That's fair, except those who will be successful must possess the moral character. So in order to be an officer, you need the responsibility of being an officer, but in order to be successful as an officer, you need the moral character. Yes. And I think what you're getting at is just because you've checked all the boxes next to all of those things in our list, according to Title 10 and the Air Force instruction, yes, you can become an officer legally, right. but that doesn't mean that you will be successful. That doesn't mean people will follow you. That doesn't mean that you will accomplish the mission. And so I think both you and I want to develop the type of leaders that we would want to follow someday. Oh, absolutely. For sure. I want to develop the type of leaders that are going to be better than me, better than you, better than any officer that's currently serving. But my point is that there is something that's different about officers than the enlisted, but clearly senior NCOs are the best leaders. Collectively, they have more experience. They have more technical knowledge. Hopefully, they have more moral character because they've been in and around the military culture for so long that the chaff has burned away, that all that's left is those of good moral character. Now, we know that's not actually true on an individual basis, but collectively, that top three, top two, and top 1% of the enlisted force are the best leaders in the Air Force, but they are not officers. I don't think leadership is unique to officership. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. So yeah, absolutely, they're some of the best leaders we have, certainly. So my point is that there is still a difference between an officer and a senior NCO or non-commissioned officer, and I just said it. It is that word commission. There is something about the commission that makes the officer versus the non-commissioned officer. I haven't fully figured out what that is, but I'm excited about the prospect of through our conversations, through feedback from our listeners, better understanding what that commission really means. And ultimately, doesn't that get down to the heart of why we're doing this podcast? Absolutely. We want to better understand what does the commission mean? What does it mean to be commissioned? What is a commissioned officer? 
how does that change the person from being a leader or has the potential for positive leadership and making them an officer? It's a difference between leadership and officership. They're not the same thing. All right, Colin. So I kind of gave you my top things I think about when I develop an officer, what I think they need to possess. What are those things for you? What are those things you think about as you are counseling, training, interacting with your students? I'm going to be totally upfront and honest. I don't know. The process of trying to figure out what an officer is over the last few months since we decided that we were going to do this has led me to think that I have no idea what an officer actually is. But again, that's why I'm so excited to figure it out because I'm an officer. People know me as an officer. I am Captain Slade. I am a captain. That is my rank. That is my title. That is my authority. But I don't know what it means. So I'm excited to, to find out what that means so I can be a better officer for myself, for my family, for the airmen that I lead, for the cadets that I instruct. I want to be a better officer. But beyond my admission of not knowing what an officer is, let me give you some thoughts about what I think an officer could be or should be. I recently read a biography of Baron von Steuben, the drill master of Valley Forge. I'll include it in the show notes. Had an explanation there of what an officer should be. According to the understanding at the time, so this was 1777, 1778, very different time period, yet the understanding of an officer at that time is, I think, still applicable today. The book described the officers and von Steuben as a father figure to his people. Now, Reed, you have kids? I do. I have kids. You and I both know what it means to be a father figure. I'm trying every day to figure that out. Just like you are trying to figure out what it means to be an officer. That's great. And that's kind of to my point is that everybody knows what a father is. We know what right looks like. We know what it means to be a good father. And yet it's so hard to put it in words. And those who are actually in that responsibility are completely floored by it. Being a father is by far the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. It's also the most rewarding. Second to that is being a husband. Third to that is being an officer. Being an officer is so hard, but it's so rewarding. Absolutely. And those of us that are in the military, either as an officer or enlisted, we all know what right looks like when it comes to what an officer is. But it's so hard to describe. Just like it's hard to describe what a good father is, but we know what right looks like. And so picture a father. It's someone who cares about their children. Or in the officer context, the officer cares for their people. They want to raise their people, their airmen, to be better than themselves. They want to give them every opportunity to succeed. They want to remove obstacles. They want to provide opportunities for growth and development. They want to protect them. But at the same time, they want to make sure that they don't hamstring them. They don't want to create this bubble around their people so that they stagnate, they stale or they can't accomplish the mission because they don't have the grit or the technical know-how. An officer is someone who is trying to grow more officers. I mean, a father is trying to grow more fathers. Or yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent mothers. point. I've heard that as a definition of leader. A leader is someone who creates more leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth mentioning too, before we get too far, mothers, right? We, won't, we don't want to forget our sisters in arms, right? Yeah. Well, absolutely. And thank you for making that point. We don't just want father figures. We also want mother figures. We want both male and female officers because they bring that different and uh, synergistic uh, perspective to the raising of future officers, just like a father and a mother bring that perspective to the raising of their children. So let us be completely open and honest about what we want in the Air Force. We want men and women. We want good men, good women of moral character who can be father and mother figures to their airmen. Now that does not mean that they have to be fathers and mothers themselves. It is a figurative role that you are in this position of responsibility, of love and protection and fostering growth of these people that you are responsible for. And with that comes what we call emotional intelligence. This ability for you to understand another person's perspective, their feelings, their thoughts, their strengths, their weaknesses, just as a father or mother would know of their own people, that you have to know your people in order to help them grow. 
if you don't know who your people are, then you're not being a good officer. You may have the title, but you are not functioning as an officer. Yeah, being able to connect on the appropriate level with your folks in order to bring them the success they are seeking is a challenge. We have people from all types of backgrounds and experiences, and I only have one background and experience. You know, I can't only rely on the tools that were successful in getting me where I am today. I have to figure out what it is about them that makes them who they are. That is hard. It's hard work. It's deliberate work. It's not something that people just have. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't happen by accident. That's something that I grow impatient with that, oh, there are natural leaders. I think there are people who have some characteristics that lend them to be more successful, but I do not think that leaders are born. I think it is absolutely something you have to work on. Oh, absolutely. I agree entirely that you don't come into this world prepared to be an officer any more than you come into this world prepared to be a father or a mother. Leaders are grown. They are trained. They are developed. Now you can bring some natural aptitude to that process of growth and development, but definitely it does not happen on accident. For these next couple of things, I want to talk about Dave Grossman's work. So he's a really fascinating intellectual thinker, psychologist, officer, and he talks about this idea of being inoculated against hate. So he says, this is a very interesting theoretical concept. But what is important to us is to understand that this process of inoculation is exactly what occurs in boot camps and in every other military school worthy of its name. When raw recruits are faced with a seemingly sadistic abuse and hardship, they are, among many other things, being inoculated against the stresses of combat. The drill sergeant who screams into the face of a recruit is manifesting over interpersonal hostility. When in the face of all this manufactured contempt and overt physical hostility, the recruit overcomes the situation to graduate with honor and pride. He realizes at both conscious and unconscious levels that he can overcome such overt interpersonal hostility. He has become partially inoculated against hate. So we see there that this process of inoculation against the stresses of combat, against the hate that you will face from an enemy, starts in our training programs. It begins that process of inoculation. So my personal opinion is that an effective officer should be inoculated against the winds of hate, against the stresses of combat. Without that, then they're not prepared for not only actual combat, but the stresses of leadership, of the accomplishment of a mission. They're unprepared for just a Monday morning. Continuing on with Dave Grossman's work, he talks about this idea of a well of fortitude. So he says, one key characteristic of a great military leader is an ability to draw from the tremendous depths of fortitude within his own well. And in doing so, he is fortifying his own men by permitting them to draw from his well. So not only does he have this well of fortitude or this ability to stare into the depths of darkness and hate and remain cool, calm, and collected. But because he is able to remain strong in that circumstance, their men are also able to do it. Their airmen are able to draw on their strength in order to be successful. So I think that an officer is someone who is not only inoculated against hate, but has a well of fortitude that is big enough and full enough to feed not only themselves, but their people. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. I've not heard it put in that term, but I absolutely see that manifest in a lot of ways. I think it's one reason we talk about bearing at training, because when things are getting difficult, and this is something I would constantly instruct my students on, the importance of maintaining bearing. I guess we should define that for some who may not know. Maintaining a stoicism in the face of stress, not using nonverbals to display discomfort or to have an emotional or physical response to a very stressful situation is maintaining bearing, like not giggling at something you think might be funny when the situation doesn't call for it, not flinching when someone's in your face a little bit, like showing that you can be someone who can be relied upon, someone who has, as described, a well of fortitude that can be drawn from. Because when you're in a position of leadership, that opportunity will come. Something bad will happen and your folks are going to turn and they're going to look at you. 
And if you do not have that well of fortitude ready, then you will have failed them. So Grossman continues to say, this is why fortitude rather than courage is the proper word to describe what is occurring here. It is not just a reaction to fear, but rather a reaction to a host of stressors that suck the will and life out of a man. The opposite of courage is cowardice, but the opposite of fortitude is exhaustion. When the soldier's well is dry, his very soul is dry. One more thing from his work that I think wraps up what I think is important as far as what an officer is is this idea of responsibility and accountability. Grossman says, the responsibilities of a combat leader represent a remarkable paradox. To be truly good at what he does, he must love his men and be bonded to them with powerful links of mutual responsibility and affection. And then he must ultimately be willing to give the orders that may kill them. So what we see here is that fatherly love and affection towards the airmen, towards their people but a willingness to make the hard choice to send that airman to their death, if that's really what is required, and a willingness to own that consequence of that decision. Now, most officers are not going to be put into a position of making that type of life or death call for their airmen, but we are in a position of responsibility and we have to be accountable because we can change people's lives for good or for bad. By our choices, by the decisions we make, we can put an airman on a path to success or a path to failure. We can change their life for good or for bad. And that can be a temporary thing, or in some circumstances, it can be very, very permanent. As an officer, you need to be prepared. You need to have the willingness, the capability, the aptitude for making the hard decisions and owning the consequences Now, in my limited understanding of what the commission is, I think that's really where it's at, is that responsibility and that potential for command. A senior NCO, as awesome as a leader that they may be, will never be a commander. But built into the commission of an officer is that intrinsic possibility, that latent possibility for command, where you have to make that call, you have to make that choice, and then own the consequence of that decision. Now, on that note, if you'll allow me, I'm going to wax religious. If you can quote for me, John 3.16. So I think I know it, but because I think I know it, I'm going to actually read it. All right. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we see in this verse an officer in action. We see God, the Lord of hosts, the captain who loves his son, who loves his servant, who loves his airman, but makes the call to send him and have him die in order to accomplish the mission. I had never read that that way. Not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I've never read it that way before. Great point. It's obviously from a Christian context, but it shows what we're looking for in an officer. We're looking for godlike men and women, people of godlike moral character who are willing to love their people and yet make the hard decision to send them to do the hard thing and own the consequence of that decision. Whoever your God is, it could be a Christian God, it could be Allah, it could be whoever. Whoever that God is, is inoculated against the winds of hate. Whoever your God is, has a well of fortitude that is big enough and deep enough for their people. God is willing to make those hard decisions and own the consequences of them because God is consistent and God is eternal. So this is a part of the reason why I'm so humbled and in awe of this idea of a commission, because on some level, I feel like I have been put into a deified position where I am responsible for the lives and possibly the deaths of other people. And I have to be willing to own those consequences. I think it's a big deal. No, I think it is too. I hadn't thought of it like that before. Anyway, I recognize that nobody's ever going to measure up. When we use that type of language, nobody will ever measure up. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we can't strive for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, Reed, do we have a better understanding of what an officer is? Maybe a little bit. Certainly give us something to think about. But getting back to something that I mentioned on my list, if you will, uh, someone willing to learn, I think it's essential to recognize that we don't know everything. And that's what we're here to do. I've absolutely learned something and it's, this has given me a lot to think about 
And hopefully for our listeners, we've given you something to think about. Yeah. So where do we go from here, Reed? Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be discussing a variety of topics and we hope that you come along. We're going to talk about how you join, how you become an officer via the variety of session sources. We're going to talk about what officers do and then all the details that go into that. So we hope that you'll join us in this journey. We also hope that you'll engage with us through social media. We have an Instagram account called Air Force Officer Podcast. You can find us there. Send us messages, send us feedback, send us your questions. You can also email us at airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com. And you also can leave us a review. We have our episodes up on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, on all the major outlets. Leave us a review, send us your questions. Let us know what it is that you're interested in, what you want us to talk about, any guests we should bring on this show. If you have you know, any experiences with an officer that you would like to share with us, you can send those to us as well. We want good, bad, ugly, of all flavors. Send us those stories and tag us with the hashtag Officer AF. This story is where an officer behaved Officer AF. That means Air Force, right? Yes. Hashtag Officer AF. Engage with us. Make this podcast informative, not only for us, but for you. We want to answer your questions and have it be as helpful as possible. And with that, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. Thank you for listening to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. The views and opinions of the authors expressed herein do not state or reflect those of the U.S. government and shall not be used for advertising or product endorsement purposes. Mention of any specific commercial products, process, or service by trade name, trademark, manufacturer, or otherwise does not necessarily constitute nor imply its endorsement, recommendation, or favoring by the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement.